Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 7, the first of the gram-positive cocci. We'll be discussing the various staphylococcal species which cause human disease. Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Module 7 in Microbiology, gram-positive cocci. We're basically going to talk about staph and strep in detail and give you what you need to know to score well. This figure shows the gram-positive scheme for cocci identification. You use different metabolic reactions to distinguish among the staph and strep species. The first test in your decision tree is catalase. If the organism is catalase positive, you have by definition a staphylococcus organism. If it's catalase negative, it's strep. Okay? Once you have staph, it's really only two more steps before you know what you need to know. If it's coagulase positive, you have Staph aureus, okay? There are a number of other features on Staph aureus shown on this slide, but the most important thing is coagulase positive, catalase positive. If it's coagulase negative, you have to do one more test, and then you give it novobiosin. If it's resistant to novobiosin, you have Staph saprophyticus, and if it's not, if it's sensitive to novobiosin, you have Staph epidermidis. On the next slide, we go on with the streptococci, and after the catalase test, which is catalase negative, you look at the hemolysis pattern. Hemolysis is the ability to break down red blood cells, or heme, get when the bacteria grow. There are different patterns which we'll show you a picture of. Once you know the hemolytic pattern, you can distinguish the different groups. The alpha hemolytic group of streptococcus includes strep pneumonia and viridin strep. These are discriminated upon by their bile solubility, where pneumococcus is positive bile solubility and viridin strep is not. A gamma hemolytic pattern gives you Lansfield group D. These are bile esculin positive. And then you put them in sodium chloride 6.5%. And if they have that positivity, you have enterococcus, enterococcus. And if not, you have group D strep, which is strep bovis and others. Most group D strep are gamma hemolytic. You can have a few other group D strep that are not gamma hemolytic. The beta hemolytic strep is a larger group is distinguished by their Lansfield groups, or the proteins on their cell wall. You have Lansfield group A, which is basically strep pyogenes. These are bacitracin sensitive. They're the only bacitracin sensitive streptococci. Lansfield group B is strep agalactase. And Lansfield group D is bile esculin positive, which can give you bovis and enterococcus, like we talked about before, with the gamma hemolytic strep. Other Lansfield groups are rare and usually not medically important. Staphylococci, like we said, are gram-positive. They're facultative anaerobes, so they can live in aerobic areas, but they also do well in anaerobic conditions. They form grape-like clusters that are catalase positive on gram stain. They are the major components of normal flora in the skin and in the nose. They are frequently involved in hospital and community-acquired infections, including Staph aureus. You talk about skin infections, you should talk about or think Staph aureus. You can get fur uncles, you can get scalded sin syndrome, scalded skin syndrome, you burn and wound infections. Also, Staph aureus can get you in other ways through food poisoning, toxic shock syndrome. It can infect your joints with septic arthritis or osteomyelitis, infect your heart valves with acute endocarditis. It'll get the lungs after a viral pneumonia, and it can spread through the bloodstream to cause bacteremia and sepsis. This figure shows some of the targets of Staph aureus, and basically it's a pretty good bug at getting any place. It starts out on your skin, and once you break that barrier, it can get to your bloodstream, to your lungs, to your heart, anywhere you want it to go. The pathogenesis for Staph aureus is by direct invasion. Like we said, it lives on the skin, and so it's a common bug, a common etiology for cellulitis, abscesses, carbuncles, and furuncles. They're usually large lesions, and if they're really big, you have to surgically drain them. If you have acute endocarditis, which is rapidly progressive, and it's an infection on the heart valves, it leads to destruction of the heart valves, shock, and lots of other problems. You get fevers, chills, myalgia, and a heart murmur. Then you can get these systemic manifestations from septic emboli to the brain. You can get strokes. To the skin, you get Roth spots. To the lungs, you can get PEs. This is where you're going to get people who are IV drug users. The Staph aureus lives on the skin. They inject it right into their veins and it causes problems. Pneumonia is usually nosocomial and usually post-viral for Staph aureus. Otherwise, it's pretty rare. 
You'll get it after influenza. You get abrupt fever, chills, and lobar consolidation on the x-ray. You can get pus in your lung cavity or an empyema. When it gets to the bone, it's called osteomyelitis. It's usually young boys who get this. Septic arthritis is most common in children and adults of 50 years older or age. You get a painful joint effusion with a high white cell count on fluid. And usually there's going to be some trauma where the, there's been a break in the adjacent skin. Staph food poisoning is important to understand that it's usually toxin mediated. Staph aureus has a number of enterotoxins, A through G, and it has super antigen activity, and it combined the vomiting center in the brain. And so it's not always necessarily in the gut. It's that the toxin gets in the bloodstream, goes to the brain, and that makes you throw up. You get it from eating contaminated foods that have not been poorly, that have not been properly refrigerated. If you get ham and potato salad or pastry that's been sitting out, then you, the bacteria will grow in the food. You'll eat the toxin. It's an intoxication, really. And then the more heat resistant, the more bacteria you get, the more sick you get. Staph food poisoning usually comes and goes within a day or so. It's a short onset and a short lasting of profuse nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and crampy abdominal pain. The toxic shock syndrome is something you'll want to know for step one. You get a high fever. You get a rash that's desquamative. You get vomiting and diarrhea. You can get hypotension, shock, and multi-organ failure, and you can die. It's toxic shock. It's mediated by a toxin, the toxic shock syndrome toxin, which you find in Staph aureus, which have it. It disseminates the toxic shock syndrome toxin throughout the body, and you don't necessarily have to be infected. In fact, this used to happen a lot with tampons. You'd have the tampon and it would get soaked with blood. The Staph aureus would grow on the tampon. The blood would circulate through and into the, into the bloodstream of the patient. And then the, the toxin would be all that you would need to get in the bloodstream and you get the problems. It's an enterotoxin F-positive Staph aureus that has it and it's similar to TSST. Both of them are super antigens. You also have an exfoliation toxin, which is what causes a desquamative rash. And this is an epidermolytic super antigen that causes scalded skin syndrome. In the immunology section, you're going to talk more about the, the characteristics of this super antigen. Staph aureus also has cytolytic exotoxins, like the alpha toxin, which forms pores, and it's cytolytic. It can cause septic shock as well. It can kill your skin and cause dermonecrosis and hemolysis. The beta toxin from Staph aureus causes hemolysis. It also causes a camp reaction, and it lyses in the cold after warm incubation. Gamma toxin will kill your tissue. Delta toxin is also called leukocytin. And the Panton valentine leukocytin are also called leukocytins. These lyse monocytes and neutrophils, your normal immune system's reaction to bacterial infection. Staph aureus has a number of other things which use, it uses as virulence factors, including its beta-lactamase. The staph aureus can get a plasmid, which encodes the enzyme, which kills all your penicillins which get at it. This is where we get MRSA, or, or methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus. This is a mutant penicillin binding protein. You also have coagulase, which can be free, floating through the, through the bloodstream, which the bacteria produces, or bound to the cell wall. This promotes thrombin formation, it forms a clot, and you get a fibrin shell which protects the bacteria. Protein A inhibits phagocytosis, as we talked about in our early module. You also have other enzymes which promote tissue invasion, which cuts through the co connective tissue of the host. Lipase, protease, hyaluronidase, fibrinolysin. The lag diagnosis for staph aureus is important because it's fairly simple. It's catalase positive, so it's staph, and it's coagulase positive. Other things include DNase positive, mannase, mannitol positive, and some other things listed on the slide. Therapy for staph aureus can be difficult because it's very resistant. Primarily, you want to use a staphylococcal penicillin, like nafcillin or oxacillin. Uh, these are usually penicillinase resistant. You could also use a first or second generation cephalosporin, like cephalexin or cephazolin. Secondarily, or your second choice antibiotics include vancomycin when you have MRSA, or when they're allergic to penicillins. You could also use monoclonal antibodies against the surface adhesion proteins. When you have vancomycin resistant and methicillin resistant staph aureus, you're really in a bind. We only have a few antibiotics in development and a few available that would be able to treat this. Linazolid is a good one. There's also quinupristine and dalfopristin. The best thing to do is to prophylactically treat topical wounds. 
and find carriers and treat them with bacitracin. You've got a simple antibiotic you can put on the skin or in the nose that'll eliminate MRSA and Staph aureus as pathogenic features. Our next staphylococcal species is Staph epidermidis. This you'll find on the skin a lot. It can cause bacteremia and sepsis, but really only when you've got an access point to it. This is common, a common cause of nosocomial bacteremia when you have catheters, IV lines, feeding tubes, or other medical devices. If you're an IV drug user, you're asking for staph to get into your bloodstream and cause problems. Usually it's more potent in immunocompromised and neutropenic patients. Subacute endocarditis happens with staph epidermidis, but it usually requires an abnormal or prosthetic valve patient. The lab diagnosis for staph epidermidis is also catalase positive, that makes it staphylococcal, but it's coagulase negative and it's susceptible to novobicin. Therapy for staph epidermidis is vancomycin plus or minus rifampin. If those don't work, you have the fluoroquinolones as options. Staph saprophyticus is the last of our staphylococcal species we'll talk about. It's a common cause of urinary tract infections, and as it goes up the urinary tract, it can cause pyelonephritis or cystitis with pyuria. Usually, it's in the newly sexually active, young, healthy women who get the staph saprophyticus UTIs. It's normally found in the floor of the genitourinary skin. They have traumatic new sexual experiences, and that causes them to introduce the bacteria into their bloodstream and the urinary tract. The lab diagnosis is it's novobiosin resistant. And that's really the big difference between it and staph epidermidis. The therapy usually is Bactrim or trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or you could use Leviquin or another quinolone if you'd like. Let's do a question. A young woman returns from her honeymoon, so that's a good clue. She complains of dysuria, urgency, and frequency. Gram standing culture of the urine reveals gram positive cocci that are catalase positive, coagulase negative, and novobiosin resistant. The most likely causative agent is, well, if you've gone through this, you know that that is the textbook definition of staph saprophyticus. Also, you have the, the basic clinical experience where you have this young, newly sexually active woman with a UTI. You gotta think staph saprophyticus every time. Next question. An IV drug user presents complaining of a swollen arm. On physical exam, he's febrile. The left arm contains a 4x4 four four centimeter area that's swollen, erythematous, and indurated. The appropriate therapy for this patient is... What we have here is an abscess. We have a skin abscess from a drug user. He's got staph into his skin. He's got a, a formed wall that pre prevents antibiotics to get in there. And so if it's big enough, like a 4x4 four four centimeter, you got to drain that puppy if you're ever going to heal it. Next question. An entire family presents to your office complaining of abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They report that they had been at the lake for a day boating and at a picnic in which they all ate macaroni salad that had been sitting out in the sun. The causative organism elaborates which of the following to cause this disease. So now we have Staph aureus food poisoning. It's an enterotoxin that we worry about or an exotoxin. And so although... Although Staph, Staph aureus is coagulase positive and has hemolysin and hyaluronidase, the mechanism by which it causes staphylococcal food poisoning is through the exotoxin. Next question. A 27-year-old female with lupus glomerulonephritis who undergoes peritoneal dialysis presents with fever, leukocytosis, and tachycardia, hypotension, and abdominal pain. You remove her catheter and send it for analysis, which reveals dense encapsulated gram-positive catalase positive bacteria adherent to the plastic tubing. The most likely organism is. So the clinical school scenario is you have somebody who's in the hospital, they're immunocompromised, they have a skin related infection that's gotten into their bloodstream and is causing a lot of problems. Uh, you have a gram positive catalase positive bacteria. You think of the normal flora of the skin. Staph aureus is there, Staph epidermis is there, you're not really going to think of Saprophyticus or either the, the Streptococcal species because they're not normal skin flora. Of the two that you find on the skin, the most likely guy here is Staph epidermidis. She's immunocompromised, uh, and that's the situation where you classically Staph epidermidis. If it was Staph aureus, she'd probably be dead already. That's the answer to that, to that question. Let's wrap up Module 7 in Microbiology. We talked about the Staphylococcal species. There are three medically important bacteria, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, and Staph saprophyticus. You should be familiar with their different reagent reactions, which ones are catalase positive, urease positive, novobiosin resistant. You should also be familiar with the different disease types that they cause, 
whether it's a UTI or superficial skin infection, or whether it's endocarditis, acute or subacute. Next up, we're going to go to Module 8, where we'll talk about the streptococcal families.